Um, I realized that when I did this uh, presentation, I forgot to add the first slide, which is a slide with the table of contents. So I have here my table of contents slide. And this is the list of topics that I'm going to talk today. Uh, there are six topics that I will touch today. I'll talk about uh, viewport dependent streaming, um, about challenges for um, test methodology for a subjective assessment of 360 video, and then uh, uh, some experimental results on uh, viewport dependent streaming for uh, bitrate reduction. And then I'll present some visual fatigue results. And then uh, I will introduce a metric which we have experimented in our, in our labs. It's uh, called the similarity ring metric. And then a few words about asymmetric video for, for VR and some results. So there are quite, uh, quite many slides that I have. I hope that I will have enough time to handle all topics. But the, ma the main idea is to give an industrial perspective uh, on this topic uh, around streaming and uh, with, some, with some results. Does it uh, work? <coughs> uh, okay. Okay, now, now it is on. Yes, so it should work. Let's see if this works. And this one works. OK, so I'll throw some problems that we have um, in this area as the challenges of 360 video compared to uh, traditional 2D video. First of all, we have more challenges in terms of bandwidth. So videos are getting larger and larger compared to normal 2D videos. That's a, a, a problem we have always had, but now it's, it's, really, it's really big. Then the second thing we have as a char characteristic of uh, 360 video is that we, uh, when we are consuming uh, videos over uh, a head with a head-mounted display, we only watch a viewport. So we only watch a subset of the whole 360 video. And that's one thing which we always have to take into account when consuming this video, but also when assessing the video in both uh, subjective uh, manner and also objective manner. But then, uh, there is also another problem. So how to ensure that the results that we get, for example, subjective results, can be comparable to each other. If I'm watching during a, a test assessment, if I'm watching most of the time in this direction, and another person is watching in this direction, how we can we compare these two sets of results? It becomes a challenge. Now, the system we have been using in this, um, our experiments is a typical streaming system where you have on the left side, you have a server side where you load the content, you have a content description, and then on the right side, uh, you have the consuming part. You have the client part, which is uh, typically a user with the head-mounted display. Uh, we have used the configurations with uh, uh, Gear VR, so with the phone mounted on the head-mounted display. And then, of course, depending on the orientations of the head, the content is then viewed according to that, uh, to that orientation. So there are some elements that are giving interactivity. Now, the concept of viewport adaptive streaming or viewport dependent streaming, there are different terminologies, but basically the meaning is all the same. What does it mean? It means that in order to save bits, streaming bits, people had the idea that whatever you are watching and is in front of you, within your viewport, within your, your head-mounted display, is streamed at high quality, and whatever you do not see, which is in the background or in the re remaining part of the 360 area, is streamed at lower quality. With this little trick, it is possible to save already a lot of bandwidth. But there are challenges, because whenever you turn your head and you change your direction, you are looking for the highest possible quality it takes some time to get that highest quality. This is different from the approach of uh, uh, viewport independent streaming where you have all the time the same constant quality for all 360 degrees, but of course it costs more bandwidth. So there are two important parameters here that are playing 
uh, an important uh, role in this game. One is the viewport size. How large uh, viewport are you watching? If it's too large and you are streaming too much data, then of course you need a lot of bandwidth. If it's too little, then for every motion you do to the left, to the right, up or bottom, you have a viewport switch and then you may experience lower quality. It's a trade-off and it requires, of course, a careful setting. And the second thing is uh, motion to high quality delay or motion to photon delay. There are different terminologies also here. I like to call it motion to high quality delay, which is the delay that it takes between the time you move your head and the time you have in the new position the high quality content, which may be high resolution content or high quality in terms of QP level. And that's also a challenge for the system because the system reaction time should be as low as possible. <clears throat> now, in terms of challenges for subjective quality assessment, Uh, people that are doing subjective tests, sessions, they need to have enough time to assess the video. So this is one thing that has to be taken into account. We are not anymore in front of a TV, we are not anymore in front of a computer screen, but we have the whole 360 around us. So we need to have enough time to look at this content, to assess this content, but not too much, because we forget. And if we forget errors, for example, there is the forgiveness problem, which is, of course, something that we have to avoid when giving scores and doing uh, assessment. And also, we have the problem of having manageable test sessions, which cannot be too long. And then, uh, as a last point, uh, we need to have a way to have a fair assessment uh, within the same subject or between different test subjects. Like I mentioned before, if a subject is looking and testing in this direction and another subject in a different direction, we do not have comparable test uh, results. So we want to make it as comparable as possible within the same subject or between different subjects. So the basis from where we started in our experiments was to look at the ITU specifications, so the standards, specs for subjective assessment. And none of them is good. None of them is perfect for omnidirectional video. So they needed to be uh, adjusted or extended in some way in order to support omnidirectionality. The test environment is different. So a typical environment is such that the, the person can move maybe sitting on a chair, but can move over the whole 360 uh, space. And the pre-screening of the test subject, we have seen this is a quite important thing because some people are actually unable to perform those tests. They get sick very quickly or uh, they get motion sickness. So we really want to avoid those, those uh, uh, side effects. So we have been using in our experiments the, the absolute, uh, absolute category rating with hidden re uh, reference as a method, which has also been used in, uh, in literature by, by other uh, researchers uh, around. And the collected results, which are uh, visual quality scores, uh, visual comfort, and post-test visual test. Uh, questionnaires. The results which I have here do not include visual comfort scores. Now, uh, from the methodology still, still from the methodology point of view, the thing which is important to tell to the people that are doing assessment of, of uh, 360 video is that, that they should score only the important thing and try to forget about uh, uh, softer crashes, flashes which may happen during watching uh, sessions or stitching artifacts because unfortunately the stitching is not perfect in some cases but they should not score of course the stitching artifacts because that, these are not part of the, of the scoring uh, uh, goal which we have. Uh, test sessions duration about 25 to 35 minutes we saw that this is the limit people can uh, uh, really uh, 
handle head-mounted display, perhaps divided into different parts, maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes, but for a total of about 35 minutes, that is, let's say, the maximum of uh, a sessions wearing head-mounted displays. And then visual fatigue questionnaires are quite important before the test and after the test in order to understand what are the effects of these tests. So the pre-screening. Pre-screening, of course, we need to avoid situations uh, that create uh, motion sickness, so we try to exclude subjects that are more, more sensitive. And then we have performed also some preliminary tests to those people to check you know, normal uh, vision tests, color tests, contrast tests, and stereoscopic vision in order to make sure that the results are correct. One more thing that which we have been recording is the interpupillary distance, this, in order to to, to have even more data to analyze in case this data is, is needed. And this is how it looks a typical test session. We have the instruction part, then uh, pre-test visual fatigue questionnaire. We do a training, some training with some uh, uh, sequences which will not be recorded in terms of, they, they will not be, they are, they are scored, but they are not taken into account uh, in the statistics. And then we have blocks of sessions with stabilizing uh, sequences in the middle in order to have statistical uh, stabilization of the results. And at the end, there is a post-test visual test fatigue, uh, visual fatigue questionnaire in order to understand the difference between the beginning and the end of the test. One more thing we have been doing is recording the head-mounted display orientation. So there are two ways. Either you get uh, uh, um, row, um, um, your pitch and roll data, or if you have access to the, the whole viewport information, then you may record what viewport is watching uh, the test subject at any point of time. One more element that we have been putting in order to have uh, comparable test results, we have been putting a little constraint about the motion direction. Because if everyone is free to watch whatever they want at any point of time, it becomes very difficult to compare those tests. So we have been instructing our subjects and tell, please, follow this motion from this position, central start position, then going to the right about 180 degrees at your own speed, and then come back to the other direction at your own speed, and then end towards uh, the center, which is the start point. It's a little constraint that made our life easier. These results have been published uh, last year in, uh, in the <clears throat> in a workshop within the ACM Multimedia Conference. <coughs> and basically, the idea was to reduce as much as possible the streaming bitrate of viewport-dependent streaming. But we wanted to understand the different cases. So there are, there are two questions that we wanted to, to understand. First of all, how do you perceive the quality difference when you're moving from this position to this position and in this position, there is a low quality for a little amount of time. How do you perceive this difference? In the case that uh, the, the background, so the background quality is, is a lower quality in terms of a QP level, so SNR quality difference. So foreground tile, high quality, background tile, what you don't see, but what you may see for a little while is at lower um, SNR quality in the first question. The second question, we wanted to understand uh, whether it is better to have in the background uh, SNR quality degradation or a degradation in terms of uh, special quality. So we run an experiment. These are the parameters we have been using with uh, Gear VR and Galaxy Phone S8 with three different video sequences in the sport domain, adventure domain, entertainment domain. The sequence were about 20 seconds long, 30 frames per second, HEVC, 
uh, with uh, independently encoded tiles, 4K resolution, stereoscopic, 12 people with us. And uh, uh, we have been fixing the maximum bit rate to 23 megabits per second. This is the tiling scheme which we have been using for a panorama view. So we have a top tile, we have a bottom tile, and then we have a background tile. So the, for, the, the frontal part was 120 degrees, which was the part that was streamed at high quality. All the remaining was at lower quality. So whenever you were moving up and looking up, you needed to have a little time to load the high quality. And that was the experiment we were interested in. So that was a little time and how that quality was perceived. So the, <clears throat> the different quality levels uh, were mm, four, and they are summarized in this table. The foreground view was always at uh, high quality, and the background was either at lower quality in terms of SNR quality or at lower quality in terms of spatial resolution. This is results that we have when we think about what's the pattern people have been watching. So this is uh, the head motion pattern between 12 people. And it tells basically the yo in the yo, uh, in the yo dimension. You may guess, we may guess, but just a guess, that people have been watching approximately the same thing at the same time, because you see that there is a, some sort of correlation in the curves. So you see that with those instructions we gave, uh, start from here, move a bit to the right, about 180 degrees at your own speed, go back to the center, and go to the left again, and then end in the center. With those instructions, people have been watching approximately the same thing at the same time. Now, these are the DEMOS values results which uh, tell that basically for decreasing QP quality, the subjective quality decreases. Nothing ex exceptional. This is as expected. Perhaps maybe less expected is the fact that, uh, that uh, <coughs> in this case, when we have a low resolution, if we increase the quality, the QP level with low resolution, we don't get better scores. So basically, the conclusion <coughs> which we, we found is that if you want to save bits for viewport-dependent streaming and you want to have foreground quality, high quality, and background with some sort of lower quality, you better use SNR quality reduction rather than resolution, uh, low resolution in the, background, in the background. The we have two examples that we can compare. We have a DMOS value of 4.5 uh, with the full resolution versus uh, DMOS of 4.2, so approximately comparable. But we see the difference is a 10% uh, between the low resolution in the background, 34%, and the low quality, the low SNR quality in the background. So, we concluded that we could have about 44% streaming bit rate reduction with a DMOS level of 4.5 with uh, SNR quality reduction. And this is the first set of results. Then, what about visual fatigue results? So we have results about uh, uh, the questionnaires that we have been uh, asking the people. And these are the results. Uh, well, these are similar parameters which we have been using. And uh, this is, again, the same motion pattern that they have been following. So this is the table of the results. And you can see that we have been asking different questions. The question was, with respect to the beginning of the experiment, do you experience stiffness, head pain, dizziness, concentration problems, nausea, sleepiness, eye pain, eye fatigue, focusing problems. Do you have dry, wet hair? 
do your eyes look into different directions? Do you have problems with clear vision or double vision? So, <clears throat> luckily nobody uh, have been reporting problems in terms of uh, the last three. And a uh, few subjects, they uh, responded that they have problems with the questions one, seven, and nine. And then uh, some other 25 to 33%, they had problems with other. But maybe the most severe symptom was dizziness, where more than half people was experiencing some amount of dizziness. OK, so the next topic is I want to reconnect to, to the beginning when I said how to make sure that people can watch the same thing at the same time. This is actually a relevant problem with 360 video, because people can always look around and then we need to have a way to make sure that people, uh, the results, the test results of the people are comparable. So we need to have a way to determine within subject correlation and also between subject correlation. Basically, do people watch the same thing at the same time if they are testing the same clip or different clips? This is what we wanted to know. And I again want to propose one of those curves, which is a head motion pattern for the same subject, but in different test conditions. So how do we understand this data? Whether to understand whether a subject has been evaluating well 12 times the same sequence or not. This is telling a little bit that uh, the subject has been following some sort of pattern, but we will need to have a metric. So the metric which we found, and we called similarity, ring metric, is, is explained in this slide. Essentially, if we have all curves, this is uh, an example with 12 different subjects, and if we want to make sure that they look the same thing at the same time, we want to ensure that those uh, vertical bars contain the curves. So these are the rings. So imagine that this is a ring, and those are the ropes that you want to go, that you want to pass through that ring. So if those ropes pass through that ring, then it means that the people have been watching the same thing at the same time. This is, of course, not true. Uh, in all cases, we can see that we have calculated that in this case, it's only 68%. But anyway, it's a quite good number already when we say that about 70% of the time, people have been watching the same thing at the same time. So this is the essence of this metric, which is measuring the similarity of how much people have been watching the same thing at the same time compared to himself or to other people. This is telling another, another uh, set of results with a similarity ring metric for all genres that we have been testing for three clips. And it's basically a total average of 67% with some peaks that are around 80%, which is pretty high, actually. So we have been achieving quite high results in terms of similarity. Of course, the higher is the number, the more confident you are that the results you have been getting are correct, and then they are comparable. So here, if, if we can find some, some conclusions, uh, methodologies we have today for assessment of 360 video are not complete and exhaustive, so we need to have more elements. One of these elements may be the similarity ring metric, which we have been uh, uh, testing in, uh, in our labs. If you want to have more details about this metric, you may look at, at that document. And the last thing I have for today is a quick snapshot about results, which will be presented next week in the ACM Multimedia Conference in uh, Amsterdam. We have been uh, 
testing asymmetric video for, for 360 degree video. Of course, asymmetric video has been tested as in normal 2D video, um, 3D video, and uh, so there is already some results for, for many years. But we wanted to somehow repeat those experiments and see how this, what are the, the values that we can, we can count on when we have head-mounted display with us mounted and then uh, doing some sort of asymmetry between left and right or how we can play with the foreground and background, foreground uh, and some sort of asymmetry between for, uh, foreground and background. So basically we found that uh, if we consider the most uh, average the most value, those values that which I had circled in, in light blue, uh, we could have a, a DMOS value of 4.4, then uh, we could achieve a bitrate saving of about 30% uh, for an asymmetry level, which is 23, 27 in terms of QP. So those are QP for left and right. Uh, you may think that you don't want to have uh, asymmetric video all the time if you don't want to compromise quality and don't want to degrade from a value of five, which is excellent, down to a value of 4.4, right? But then you may use this technique for adaptation purposes. So in periods when you do not have enough bandwidth, you may want to have to sacrifice for a little while quality in order to have adaptation period and then go a bit down using uh, asymmetric video. We have been looking also at eye dominance. Is it relevant whether you are eye dominant, right eye dominant, left eye dominant in these results? No, it doesn't matter in these results that we had. So we have been exp um, experimenting this and basically it does not make any difference. And the last slide I have and then I conclude it is about streaming uh, background only tiles with asymmetric <coughs> video quality. So the previous results I showed you were about asymmetry, uh, where I have uh, <coughs> asymmetric between, uh, asymmetry between foreground and background. Here I have asymmetry between uh, only in the background. And I can see from these results that for a DMOS value of 4.2, I could achieve another 15% uh, bitrate saving. So if I put all together, all the different asymmetries all together, maybe I could achieve even, even more. So if I have uh, about 30% in this case, and then 5 to 15%, I'm getting close to 40% in terms of, uh, of compound results. So these results will be in the ACM Multimedia Conference uh, in the Packet Video Workshop next week. Uh, I don't know if any of you is going there, for sure. It's going a little there. Patrick as well. Okay, so I'll see you there. That's all I have. Thank you. Maybe I can save some time for the next presentation. Thank you very much. <coughs> okay, your questions, please. Uh, yes, I have bench of questions. Uh, we have plenty of time. Okay. Please go ahead. Uh, so about uh, these asymmetric techniques, so uh, that's pretty in line, actually, the, the, the fact that the uh, high dominance yeah is not an uh, influencing factor. That's something that we also observe for um, uh, stereoscopic content. So you have the same result? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, uh, yeah. It has been published in uh, yeah. transactional broadcasting, yes. actually to TOB. But that was not for 360. But that, uh, so it's good to see that. Uh, there is alignment. It, it, yeah, that's, that's yeah. good. Yes, because it was always this discussion and some people are using some kind of trick. Yes. But they switch left, right, uh, asymmetric condition. Yes. So I guess that here you always put the quality on one eye and... Uh, yes, it's easier. Uh, it, uh, yes, it uh, is uh, easier. Yes. Basically, Alternating. this table says that there is a, a difference of 0 0.08 yeah. DMOS value, which is basically insignificant. So, there's uh, no difference. But, but <coughs> I have one question, because uh, here you are measuring the mean opinion score. Uh, did you use also the uh, questionnaire that you use in your first experiment uh, uh, about uh, sickness, fatigue, and so on, because uh, one one uh, possibility of such technique uh, is that it triggers some kind of cognitive effort 
because it's true that we are playing with binocular rivalry. You mean for the asymmetry? And but it, it, it it's not a doesn't come as a as a free lunch, right? You yes. It means that the brain has to, yes, to yes. deal with that. And if you if you um, it, use this trick too long, then it. It, yeah, it, it may have it, some effect. Yeah, exactly. Yes, you, in this experiment, not, we have not okay. done the the okay. questionnaire. Uh, but uh, I understood that you want to use it <coughs> in a short amount of time. Yes, you may use it for it. adaptation yeah, purposes, yeah. then it's yeah. basically okay. not, not giving you, any, okay. any so impact. You, yes. So you don't have the data for this, but... Uh, no, I think okay. we don't have. Harry, do we have this data? I think not. For the stereoscopic. I think we don't have the, in this experiment, we have not done that okay. questionnaire, yes. Uh, that, that, that would be interesting because there are some, people are suspicious that this is, you cannot play too long with this type of a trick. And yeah, it would be I nice to identify what is the time window before you trigger some. Uh, it could uh, be an interesting silver, experiment. Uh, um, and I have another question. Can you give more details about this uh, ring similarity? Uh, Metric, so yes, as I, I think it's very uh, yes in line with some of the. Uh, yeah, well, first of all, that how we can control the trajectory of observers and to to achieve some kind of a yes. Yeah, so the idea would be between. to put that constraint that yeah. we have been putting about the direction, yeah. which could be anything but some form of constraint, okay. such that the people would be more or less aligned on yeah. the same viewing pattern, okay. and then this <coughs> using this metric for for. Uh, for calculating the, the similarity. I, I, can, I can point you, I can give you a document where there is okay. more description about uh, okay. how this is calculated. So it's a comparison of trajectory of uh, each observer? It's calculated point by point. point, by so point. it's instantaneous, okay. it's a calculation of point by point from the, from the, okay. From okay. the time okay. point of view. So if, for example, we have been sampling the head mounted display movements yeah. every 100 milliseconds, okay. so we take a, every sample point in every at every okay. uh, sample okay. data point for 10 people, 12 people, and then we analyze what's the, okay. what's well, the distance or the, co okay. or the correlation so, yeah, I'm between. I'm curious to, to, to look at the, the details because yes. that's, some, that's a big trend also these days also to find some way to compare this trajectory. And you can uh, also decompose eventually this uh, head trajectory as a set of, uh, um, let's say, fixation and saccade but head saccade and head fixation. So there are few f methods to compare these type yes. of things when you do this. So, so yes. yeah, I'm curious to... Okay, I can uh, point to this yeah, and then yeah, I think yeah, we can yeah, even yeah. talk later yeah. to, during today. Uh, thank you. Okay, thanks thank you for the much. comments. More questions? Uh, uh, just a question about the streaming, uh, the first experiment. You're saying that uh, you ask not considering buffering problems or something like that. Uh, how yes. did you succeed in this? The best that we could, of so course. Uh, we had to rely on the subjects. So we were informing them, but of course we had to rely but on the subject. did you experience any delay or buffering problem during the experiment? Uh, you mean from the implementation yeah. point of view? It might be that sometimes there are, there are some flashes because there were no software crashes. This is, this is I'm sure of that. So the software was pretty stable. But uh, occasionally there may be uh, some flashes, which I think they are given by the phone. So some some so, so not some strange events, event. which could be a flash. So we wanted to make sure that this event is not scored either in a positive or in a, in a, in a, neg in a negative direction. So we were informing the people that please do not take this into account. Do not look at the stitches, at the stitching errors, because you don't have to score that. There were no, there were no crashes, and there were actually no extra delays or rebufferings in our, in our environment, because we were using a wireless LAN access point, some sort of isolated environment. So there, were, there was no cross traffic. So basically, it was a dedicated uh, network for that. Okay, thanks. Can I just ask about this questionnaire? Um, your post fatigue questionnaire. Thanks very much. Um, is asking a person to uh, make a rating or a, an assessment of a, a symptom in relation to that that they felt at the beginning of the test. Is that correct? Yes. Did you consider asking the person to make a rating at the beginning and at the end and then subtracting the difference in the ratings? 
So the same questionnaire at the beginning and at the end, and then looking at the change in the rating over the questionnaire. Uh, the rating was not numerical. It was yes, no. Oh. So the difference, it was not easy to calculate the difference. So the questionnaire was, do you feel nausea? Do you have dizziness? Yes, no. So not a scale of, do I feel nauseous? Not at all, a little. You're not rating the amount of... Oh, OK, OK. So, yes. Uh, this is the questionnaire, yes. So if you, okay, if you think that this could be a, a numerical, yes, this is. But we have not made the difference. They were, Maybe. So, they were so little symptoms, just one, two, three, so it was insignificant. I'm just wondering how you could expect somebody to remember their level of the symptoms 20 minutes previously when they were when they were looking at, or at the beginning of the thing, you're asking them to remember these, the, the level of these symptoms, these 10 symptoms, and then make a judgment about the feeling of those now compared with what they were at the beginning? Well, at least there was some, the scale was telling a little more the same, a little bit less. So it's, there was some sort of relation to how it was before when we say the same. So of course, we were relying on the subjects. But I think the point of making, having a way to make the difference could be interesting. Maybe we have to think about if, we, if you convert this into, into numbers and then we find the differences, it could be some interesting so study. Okay, I think it's a good good input. Thanks.